Yeah, so thanks for coming along. Uh, we are Cameron, that's me. I'm a solutions architect based out of the UK. I worked for Acquire for about four years now. Um, being a solutions architect means that I kind of bridge the commercial and technical side of what we do. Um, so I talk to people who are interested in using Drupal and Acquire products and I convince them that we can do what they need to do uh, and remove any technical blockers. With me I've got Will Eisner, who's a Senior Director for Products. So you want to describe what you do, Will? Yep, I'm a, I'm a product manager for Acquia. So my job is to help build the Acquia Cloud platform and Acquia Cloud sites actually. That's about it. Sure. Okay. So just to put into context what Acquia does, I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about our vision. So we're always tweaking this and working on new ways to think of ourselves, but it's useful to have kind of a, a north star to, to attach ourselves to. So I think at the moment we're talking about making it possible for dreamers and doers to craft the digital world, which is a little fluffy, but I think we can all be kind of confident that we're all dreamers to some extent or another. We all kind of believe in the possibilities. Um, but the doing of it is what uh, takes up all the time, right? So we want to try and take as much of the boring stuff out of the doing and make the dreaming a little bit more easy. And to do that, uh, we want to deliver uh, a universal platform for that. And a universal platform means, uh, in context like a subscription uh, element, where we provide a bunch of services that you can rely on. We don't lock you into anything, uh, data or... Uh, we don't lock up your data, we don't lock up your code. It's all in support of open source. We really believe that in that as a company. Um, but we want to create a part of the platform that makes it a lot easier, a lot more reliable. But uh, a platform kind of means a different things to different people. Uh, and a digital project means different things to different people. And all of these people have a stake in, uh, in that and they have a lot of work to do and they rely on a lot of tools and technologies to do it. So, you know, it's tempting at a DrupalCon to think uh, of it as just a developer, uh, but, and that's my background, so that's often how I think of things, but obviously the business owner uh, wants it to do what they need to do. The digital platform owner has a whole different set of responsibilities, and often the things that these people need to do can actually be in conflict. Um, and what we've seen over, you know, lots and lots and lots of site builds for lots and lots of customers is that we see the same things happening, and when we see an opportunity to kind of ease some of the friction uh, in that cycle, uh, we will create a product that, that helps to do that, and that's what Will is uh, responsible for bringing to market. These are the personas that we use uh, when we think about the products that we, we have, um, and so I'll kind of refer to these as we go through. Obviously, there are personas. Uh, in a real world, there's a, a lot more people than just four in a team. And you know, if you think of Drupal, you could argue that there's thousands and thousands of people that are contributing to a site build. Um, so we want to plug in where it makes sense to those people. Uh, and we obviously, we're indebted to the community for a lot of what they provide to us, but we try to put, give back as much as we can. So some of the stuff I'll talk about as well is like, it's open source. Uh, it's stuff that we contribute back into the community. So this is how we see a, a digital life cycle um, this year. <laughs> it's always evolving. It's an iterative process. Um, it's something that kind of never ends. Uh, you'll have an idea. Uh, you'll need to create some content around that idea. You'll curate that, put it out into the market. Uh, you need to orchestrate how that data gets in front of people. Uh, you need to analyze what's working and what's not working. Um, hopefully, you can build up a profile of who's visiting your site and then enrich your experience. And so. You know, we've got products that sit against those. So what I'm going to talk about today, um, some of these logos might be a bit mysterious without text below them, but broadly we've got Acquia Cloud, uh, Drupal 8 and Lightning, Content Hub, Lyft, uh, and some other bits and pieces that fit into that. So there's a lot there, um, and necessarily we'll be kind of whipping through. This is the, uh, the Trinity College Library, if you haven't been there. It's really amazing. Um, but yeah, we're going to try and get through quite a lot of um, a lot of our products, uh, and because of that, we won't be able to go into a huge amount of detail. Um, but if there's anything that you are particularly interested in, um, you can swing by the booth or find one of us or anyone wearing an Acquia shirt, and we can either help you out there and then, or we can put you in touch with someone who can go into more detail. So uh, this is how we kind of categorize our, um, our platform and what it means uh, in terms of practical tools that you can use. So 
Along the top there, you can see the kind of channels that end up being part of a, a digital program. Um, these are always changing and adapting. Um, you know, something that's come out reasonably recently as being uh, having a lot of momentum is uh, voice control. So Amazon Echo, Siri, and lots of other things like that. Um, but there's all sorts of things, traditional web, of course, phone, chat, mobile, and on and on it goes. Um, I guess the common thread that brings all those together is having an open and robust API. So everything we do, uh, we're trying to push around uh, via API, and we hope to be soon uh, totally API first on everything we do. The areas, um, so kind of at the base of that is cloud. Um, so we will go into more detail on that too. But, you know, people want that to be secure, uh, performant, elastic. So if you have a big spike, your uh, site can grow to cope with that. Um, but there's also a lot of management that goes with that. And there's management from a technical level, but also, you know, commercial. Uh, we spoke about those personas before, the digital platform owner. How do you handle um, managing thousands and thousands of sites or hundreds or tens? Uh, it gets really complicated really quickly. So we're trying to provide some tools there. Experience assembly is kind of a fancy way to say uh, CMS, uh, Drupal and Lightning, and some tools that plug into that. Um, and we'll talk about that. The bits on the top are kind of the services that can sit on top of Drupal uh, and provide a little bit more um, value. So universal content is about getting your content uh, to the right device at the right time. Um, and from any source, so any source, any de destination. Contextual interaction is about making sure that when I visit a site, it's right for me. Uh, when Will visits a site, it's right for him, and so on and so on. And that's challenging to do at scale. Um, I think Drupal's historically been really good at that, but doing it uh, for every single visitor to your site uh, and making sure that things work is, is a real challenge that we're facing every day. And that's where those products fit in. So I'm gonna start talking about them one by one now. Um, so I guess where we start uh, is at Queer Lightning. So Equia Lightning came out of a project that uh, actually my team ran where we would give demos to clients who were interested in Drupal for a long time. Uh, and we realized that we were just doing the same work over and over and over again. So we thought, hey, why don't we uh, create a distribution or a packaged version of Drupal that has a lot of those features in one place? So instead of starting from scratch, we start with a kind of head start. And that works well and it still works well, but then what we begin to realize is that there's a way that we could do that, not just for, uh, for demos, but also for actual sites that are being deployed. Um, something we actually tended to hear a little bit was like, oh, we saw all this cool stuff in the demo, but it didn't end up in our, in our live site. And we thought, hey, that doesn't sound right. So we took a lot of what we um, did in demos and we packaged it up. Uh, we used the release of Drupal 8 as a great opportunity to, uh, <coughs> to sort of reset how we do that and start from a, a greenfield um, to build a whole bunch of features into Lightning. So if you were to go to uh, lightning.acquia.com or drupal.org and grab Lightning, you would get a packaged version of Drupal 8 that was already set up and configured with all these kinds of things, layout, workflow preview, media, uh, security integrations and testing, and lots of other things besides. It's totally open source, uh, developed in the open. And one of the nice things, if you've been working in Drupal for a while and used uh, distributions, you may have had the experience where uh, the distribution will move on and be upgraded a version and getting from the version that you've got to the next version can be really challenging. We've committed uh, with Lightning that we will maintain security and, and uh, functionality updates that will be compatible and have an upgrade path. So if you start a site build on Lightning today on Drupal 8.1 and then a few months down the line, Drupal 8.2's got a whole lot of new stuff, there will be a way to do that with Lightning uh, which will all be managed by us and supported by us and will be open source. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, if you've been around Drupal for a while, you'll probably be familiar with this, what's gonna, we're gonna see. Um, where you would start, you do a site, uh, you base it on Drupal, everything's fine, it works, you install a few modules, do some configurations, run some themes, looks okay. But then uh, you have to do two or three or five or 10 more sites. So you think, hey, uh, I'm gonna create my own distribution, my own version of Drupal that does all the things that we need it to do, and I'm gonna maintain that. But clearly there's you know, some effort in building that in the first place, and then there's some effort in maintaining it on an ongoing basis, which is additional to what you have to do to manage the actual sites day to day. So what we figure is that in a lot of cases, you'll be able to take Lightning and remove a lot of that headache. 
So you can still have this, uh, the, you know, all the stuff that's in Drupal core, you can still manage your sites on an individual basis, but you can use Lightning to provide a lot of that base functionality that you would otherwise have to assemble yourself. And Drupal being Drupal, you can put uh, your own customizations on the top. So Drupal, if you're new to it, uh, has been developed in the open for like 16 years now, and it's good at being modular. It's good at using code from different places. So Lightning's very aware of that and designed uh, with the notion in mind that people are going to want to make changes um, and add plugins so that you can continue to use Lightning and have all the updates, but also have your custom stuff and your sites, and they can all coexist. That's Lightning. Um, and that's fine, uh, it's all very conceptual, but actually getting it from uh, you know, running on your laptop to running it live is a whole other story. Especially when you're running uh, lots and lots and lots of sites, um, that becomes much more of a challenge. And you know, we see customers again and again that will have not only lots of sites, but they'll have lots of teams. They might have different um, agencies in different locations. Uh, they've got different people they wanna give certain levels of access to the code and some they don't and so on. So again, uh, we saw the need and we came up with this thing called the Build and Launch Tool, or BLT for short. So that's an Acquia built tool. Uh, it's all there for creating new projects from a template uh, with a lot of, m in much the same way that Lightning is constructed, with some out of the box ideas um, and best practices that are baked into the structure. So that might not mean a lot when you see it uh, there, but when you think about all the things that you kind of need to configure and get right to get a project going uh, that's big and complex and might need different things for different sites and different teams, um, there's a lot to configure. So the idea is that you create a project, uh, you define what your base uh, version of Drupal is, you define your tests, your documentation, um, you know, your configs, uh, how the code's structured, what happens on site A or site B when it's deployed, uh, what happens in dev, what happens in prod, what happens when you commit to git and so on and so on. All of that stuff has kind of been worked out and structured in a way that uh, with a few of the scripts and tools that we provide, you'll be able to um, set that up and kind of reduce the maintenance headache of maintaining that. This is something that um, you know a development manager or a build engineer could spend their whole week, month, year doing. We're trying to kind of take some of that off the plate. Again, this is an open source project. Um, you just got a GitHub and fiddle around with it. It's all quite well documented. Um, and it's an ongoing basis, on an ongoing basis. So this is an example of someone setting up uh, a new project based on, on Bolt or BLT. So you just define a few um, configs. Um, you know, you will send it some names, uh, some install profiles, in this case, Lightning, uh, some upstream version control, uh, set which versions of modules or uh, distributions you want to use, database connections. Once that's all set up, uh, you can just run a script and it will start to build uh, an archive for, or an attribute for, uh, for development and testing. So uh, if, you're, you know, if you're a developer and you're used to using Composer or um, site install scripts, this will be um, not unfamiliar to you. Um, we're just trying to do it in a way that incorporates not only Drupal best practices, but also around testing and documentation and so on. So I think you should uh, run an install and you'll see them log in. And so there's a, this is kind of the use case of someone doing it on their local machine for development. Um, and that's, you know, typically if, if you're new to Drupal, that's how a development works. Like people will have a version running on their local machine and then they'll deploy into an integration environment uh, to do, you know, you know, systems integration testing or QA or um, whatever, and that's it. So yeah, that might not be that revelatory to you if you've kind of done this sort of thing before, but I think um, what we're basically seeing is that we've kind of uh, formalized a lot of the knowledge that we were seeing again and again on our own projects. And we think it's made a difference, right? So we've got a big professional services team. Um, they 100% use BLT on every single project. It's like four weeks of developer time saved per project. Um, means that all of our projects have testing, which wasn't necessarily the case before. It means that any custom code built, brought into the, uh, into the distribution or the, or the deployment is compliant with Drupal coding standards, which implies uh, that it's probably more secure, it's easier to read, it'll be easier to upgrade in the future and so on. 
And we also bake in some, some uh, best practice around you can't deploy a module that's got known security problems and so on. And there's a whole lot of other stuff going on, but I think the, the kind of takeaway is that once you get your head around it, it does tend to save a lot of time, um, f especially for those repetitive tasks that need set up on every project. Um, we've got a, a bunch of internal testimonials from people saying that they don't get failures in deployment, which is if, you know, a nightmare it can be. Sure. Uh, much less of a benefit. Like I kind of think the overhead of doing it might not be worth it. Um, it's also not the, you know, if you've already got an existing project, it doesn't make a huge amount of sense to retrofit it into this. Sure. But it's well worth looking into. Um, it does have a few things set up, like if you're planning to use Thing or um, PHP, you know, a lot of that stuff's kind of already there. So yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we do use it on every project, so that includes projects that are single site, but yeah, I think it's less uh, useful, it's still useful, but less useful with, with this one. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so you saw all that stuff that that developer was typing into his console there. Um, and you know, what, what we're seeing emerging a lot is that, especially in Drupal 8 land, uh, projects are built from a set of definitions, they're built with Composer, they're not um, as simple as they used to be. They imp incorporate a lot of tools. Um, and a lot of those tools make a massive amount of sense of development, but they don't make so much sense when you push out to production. Uh, this is much more so in Drupal 8 than it ever was in Drupal 7. And so there's a really good blog post actually by Michelle Krejci about um, deployment. You know, production is actually just an artifact of development. Your development can be thought of as like a factory and then your production is like the pr finished product. And so we don't want everything that's in the factory out on the street, you know. There's a lot of things that don't make any sense. And a typical, not even a, not even a complex project will use all of these kinds of things. So there'll be some CSS preprocessors and, and frameworks. There'll be task runners with Grunt, you know. There's probably a GitHub or Bitbucket or something like that that's managing pull requests uh, that needs code, um, checking with code module. There's BHAT tests, there's PHP units, there's Composer and so on and so on. All of that stuff is cool, but in reality, once we go to production, we just want our site to be deployed out uh, to our hosting, which is hopefully actually a cloud. And there's a lot of tools in there, right? So I won't go through these in detail, but in a typical um, sprint cycle, you know, there's people using SAS, there's people using uh, Composer, there's people using BHAT and so on, and stuff I covered kind of before. But this will happen uh, at every deploy. It might happen multiple times on a sprint. Um, getting all of those tools set up that do all of that stuff uh, is kind of a task in itself. It's something to maintain. So our idea is that we will have uh, a managed service called Aquid Pipelines that'll run in the cloud. You define a uh, YAML file in your uh, repository. Uh, you deploy it up. Uh, we'll see it there. If it's there, we'll say, okay, we're going to run some build tasks. We'll spin up a temporary environment that'll do all of that for you. So it'll run uh, Node.js to run all the JavaScript tasks, you know, do all the CSS, all of the stuff we've just mentioned. Once it's passed all of the tests and all the codes in, in the right space, we'll push it out to our dev stage or production environment, whatever you have configured. So that means that you don't deploy code that doesn't work or don't deploy code that's not up to standard. That's the idea. We're gonna run it as a, uh, yeah, as a service. So we will maintain it in a way that makes sense for Drupal. Um, much in, in much the same way we have cloud is like a it's a Drupal runtime. It's not a generic hosting environment. It'll be tuned uh, just for running Drupal projects. Uh, it's actually in private beta at the moment. It'll be in public beta next quarter or this quarter, I guess now. Um, and cool. And generally available early next year. So if you are interested in it, um, come and find us, and we can we can talk to you about getting you into that. Okay, so we're moving up the stack now, um, heading into Cloud Site Factory. So yeah, for those who don't know, I don't think I've spoken to some of you before, you may know that we run uh, what I like to call a Drupal application runtime that sits on top of Amazon Web Services. Uh, so it's a highly tuned, highly available platform as a service that's designed just for running Drupal. Um, <coughs> The idea is that you have your code uh, and your content, you bring us that and we handle all of the infrastructure issues around security, uh, performance, availability, and so on. Um, 
Site Factory uh, extends that into moving from providing tools for hosting and managing your code into actually managing sites uh, as a sort of logical unit so that you can run many sites uh, across however many um, teams, locations, whatever, however you organize yourself. Uh, and you can have a dashboard that shows those. You can govern them from a central place. So you get a lot of the benefits that Drupal brings with multi-site, but you get uh, a sort of software as a service tool that gives you kind of a heads up on what's actually going on at a site level. Cloud will save you a lot of effort because instead of having to maintain all of these things um, via managed hosting or via yourself, uh, we will handle it for you. So we've got a like, dedicated operations team, a dedicated cloud engineering team that's globally uh, distributed who are monitoring uh, Aqua Cloud 24-7. We're actually running about 14,000 instances in AWS or more, uh, and we've got really good uh, historical uptime. Uh, yeah, it's all highly available. We have uh, a lot of security certifications, so you know PCI DSS, ISO 27001, FedRAMP. Uh, if you know or you have to deal with that stuff, um, you'll know a lot of those acronyms. They're a real pain to maintain. Um, but we handle it, and it's really key to our business that we do. So you can be guaranteed that if you deploy your code here, you'll meet all of those standards, which may be applicable to you or your clients' uh, requirements. So I think one of the things that we'll show you today is uh, kind of in line with what we've been talking about so far, is the development tools that allow you to actually get your site out onto that platform. So all customers uh, get as a minimum a de development, a staging, and a production environment. Uh, we really try to simplify the act of deployment. Uh, if you're a developer, you'll know that deployment can be really painful. And uh, if it's not reliable, it can really introduce a lot of nasty bugs and issues and stress. Um, we also enable all of that stuff. Um, so you can do it in a web UI, which is all permission management and all that sort of stuff, but you can also do it via an API. So if you've got Jenkins or some other build system, you can hook into it and run these kind of tasks uh, remotely. So you don't actually have to log in and click things. This is an example of a typical use case where you might have finished a sprint and you're doing some sprint testing. You want to grab the latest copy of the code um, so we're going to deploy the master branch to our staging environment, give it a, uh, a nice little message so that when someone checks the tag later on, they'll know what was going on. And then we're also going to pull down the code and the database from production so that we know we've got the latest configuration and content uh, for our testing. So as you can see, it's just a case of dragging and dropping between environments, uh, and then all of those uh, site components will be will pull in, they'll be isolated, uh, duplicated, and then you can do your testing. So as I say, uh, all of this stuff is totally um, API-able. So if you do have your own tools and systems, anything that you see here can be done via an API. There's a whole lot of other stuff in there that I won't show around real-time log streaming, around automatic backups, around doing stuff via Drush or the shell. Um, but that's kind of at the core of the development tools. So in that example, uh, I was running in the cloud. So you have a dedicated dev stage and production environment. Uh, it's sort of typical day-to-day -day workflow would be you do your own code on your own machine, whatever you like, whatever you prefer, and then you start to integrate with the other people's code on the development or staging environments. So you don't do all, you don't rely on Drupal environment on your development system. Often you want to see it through some old code. So we, we have a, a, a like all-in-one product called Acquia Dev Desktop, which is a like a MAMP or a WAMP. Uh, environment, uh, which you can log into your Acquia account, and it will pull down all of the sites that you have so that you can work on them locally. Uh, and that's you know that's a really good way to get started quickly, especially if you're newer to that. Um, a lot of people are quite opinionated, like myself, about their local environment, so you don't have to do it that way. If you want to do it your own way, it's fine. But we do have tools that we support; uh, they're free. Anyone can use them, regardless of whether you're an Acquia customer or not, and they're really well integrated. So yeah, the short answer is yes. We give you something local. So Site Factory is built on top of cloud, um, but it changes the kind of the notion from managing code uh, to managing sites. So before we were strictly dealing with databases and files and, and version control, what this means is that instead of that, you're managing at a site level. So um, if you're familiar with Drupal, you may 
uh, know about the concept of multi-site where you have a single code base that can run one to many sites. And I kind of alluded to that earlier. Um, we can also, uh, via this interface, run across uh, multiple code bases or multiple geographies. So I'll sort of show you what that means in practice. This is kind of a, a, a dashboard where you could see a whole lot of sites um, that are deployed in live. Um, for each of the sites I can log in, I have a centralized login meca mechanism. I can do things like back them up or um, clear caches, things like that. I can filter on like how busy they are, uh, what their domain is, uh, a whole bunch of other things. Um, and I can arrange sites into groups. You can see there's a whole lot of groups along the left uh, and you can control access to those groups on a very fine grained level. So, you know, as an admin, I kind of see everything, but you might not want that. have to have, uh, for this interface, yes, this is Site Factory that we're looking at. The underlying um, kind of guts that makes Drupal run many sites is not, is native to Drupal, but to have this, yeah, this is this is a Site Factory capability. So you can see there I've just, uh, I've just uh, created a new site and so it's as simple as that. So I can go in as, a, as an administrator, I can click a few buttons, choose a, you know, the distribution I want to use, uh, the location or the hosting cluster that I want to use, give it a name, give it a domain, uh, click go and then the site will be built. You can see there in my little group, uh, we've got our new site. Uh, the site's been built. Um, the eagle eyed might have seen that I chose the minimal install profile, which is kind of the minimum that Drupal will allow you to do. Uh, and there's my site. You can see also that uh, my account on the site factory is actually being um, federated out to the destination site. So I don't need to maintain a login for every single site in my network. Uh, as an, uh, I'm an administrator, I'll automatically get created as an administrator and I can just have single sign-on across the whole group. So does it also create the Git repository as well? So we have um, a central Git repository. Um, and so basically we're talking, so each site will have the way that the code is structured so that certain parts of the code will be applicable to certain sites, but underline that as a single repository. Um, with Stacks, is it a single repo or is it multiple repos? Each Stacks has its own repository. Okay, yeah, so we have this uh, optional um, functionality which we call Stacks, which is where you might want to have uh, multiple repositories because you've got sites that do very different things. Uh, and then you will get one per stack. So it's not per site, it's per stack. But we can talk about that in lots of detail uh, if you find me afterwards. Well, we've got a lot of clients, so the one that we talk about a lot is Pfizer, um, Veolia, uh, Warner Music Group, um, what's some other good ones that we can talk about? Uh, I think it probably skews a little bit more towards the kind of marketing sites that are a little bit more static. Um, obviously, they've got editors and, you know, they're CMS driven. They're not literally static sites. But I think in general, it tends to where people have a, a lot of more simple sites. Um, there's no limitation there. Um, you know, it's a full install of Drupal. Every site's completely a full install of Drupal. You can do whatever you like. But I think just... In practice, the overhead of uh, the mental overhead of managing a lot of complex sites uh, usually means that they get broken out into their own uh, into their own environment. Uh, I think, yeah, one of the a great example actually of consumer packaged goods is a really good one because those companies will have uh, like 20 brands, say, and those 20 brands might be deployed into 20 countries. So that's you know it might be 400 sites per brand, um, or you know it might be 400 sites total. Sorry. How do you manage that? You know, how do you handle that uh, when you want to keep consistency and not have to pay for a site 400 times over? And so we've got like Nestle does that, uh, SAB Miller, which is one of the biggest brewers in the world. Um, that's a really good use case when you need to deploy into lots of regions and lots of languages. Works works really well. So moving up again. So assuming that you've got all your sites now deployed and running, uh, and you need to start moving content around between them so that stuff doesn't get siloed away. 
So we talk about this generally as the idea of universal content, uh, and content becomes a service. So Drupal itself is really good at structured content uh, and metadata, um, and you know, within a sin single Drupal uh, install, you know, you can do lots of really cool things. And in fact, you can share content out using APIs in lots of uh, in lots of different ways. But this is another case of us seeing people doing this in lots of different ways and thinking maybe we could standardize this and make it a bit easier for everyone. So Content Hub, it's a cloud-based content distribution and discovery service. That means effectively it's a big database sitting in AWS with a whole lot of APIs against it uh, that allows for automatic discovery and distribution of content. We see this a lot. Um, we hear it a lot. People have content all across their organizations. Sorry, skipped ahead and it's locked away. So there's a whole lot of content that the team in Germany made, which could be fantastic, I don't even know it exists. Or, um, you know, the UK team is creating a lot of stuff that everyone needs, and the way they get it around is they stick it in an Excel file and email it, it's just crazy. But that's something we hear again and again and again. What that means is that instead of trying to f actually reuse the content that's been created at expense and effort, um, people just recreate it again and again and again. Um, it's just easier to do it that way than to actually use the stuff that's already there. And it also means that content gets locked so that people only ever see it via the CMS where it might make a lot of sense to see it somewhere else uh, on a different channel um, in a different place. So we created this, this cloud-based service and we've built a lot of connectors as standard that interact with the API and that can aggregate content from those providers and put it into a normalized uh, database which then uh, other um, clients can consume. So, you know, Magento, WordPress, Hybris, uh, Adobe AEM, Drupal, and lots of things besides. Uh, it's a simple API, it's easy to integrate with, but we are continually building connectors as customers ask for them and uh, making them available. That means that in a lot of cases, we have customers who want to centralize content creation. Uh, they want a single master site that pushes content out to all of their client sites. Uh, or, this is, uh, more complex but happens a lot as well where every site is both a, a, a content producer and a content consumer um, and the content hub manages all of that stuff so that all of the other sites know about it uh, so it unlocks the content silos so that you can start moving content around it can either be uh, hub and spoke or it can be peer-to-peer -peer. Uh, it doesn't need Drupal doesn't need to be the arbiter of what who that sees what you could have systems talking via Content Hub that have nothing to do with Drupal. Of course, we've got support for 8 and 7 and, and other stuff as well when they're ready to go. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is actually, uh, is it? Yeah. This is actually someone fiddling around with Content Hub in a, in a Drupal 7 uh, instance. Um, you can see this is uh, quite simple content. Um, it's just shown on a, on a, on a uh, reverse uh, chronological order. But as soon as content gets put into the hub, it's basically instantly available. So um, this person's filtering through to see what's available. You know, basic filters around date, source, stuff can be tagged. And this is kind of using it in a manual fashion, but it's uh, got full rule support in Drupal. Um, so you can import content automatically uh, and then put it into your workflow system. So for example, you might say, if the site uh, in the UK has new content, automatically import it into my site, but don't publish it send a notification to uh, the content admin for checking uh, so that they can review it before they actually publish it. Yeah, so that's Content Hub. Sure. sure, so the question was about how we deal with translations uh, and that's, do you want to cover that one? Or? Thinking when you set up the 
So we, we'd probably class that in a kind of different category of tool. So, you know, machine translation, which is not something we provide as Eclair as a service, but there's lots of tools that plug into Drupal um, that can do that. Uh, there's free ones and expensive ones and everything in between. Um, I think in practice I've seen, I mean, we've got lots of clients who run a multilingual suite of sites. In practice they prefer to just get their people to do it because machine translation is great, but it's not as good as a human ever, right? Um, and it's complex. I mean, managing all of that content across languages is really complex. And I think while there are some really good solutions out there, people kind of throw up their hands and say, oh, we'll just let the guy in the corner do it. Um, but it's, it's an interesting space. Yeah. How do you deal with uh, migration, somehow sentencing across the devices? Because you know, for example, that maybe you'll, you'd like to display more content on the desktop, but you will send less and yeah, so that, from our perspective, would really be Drupal's responsibility, and it's really about your information architecture. So, um, you know, today I think uh, responsive web design is most sites start with that in mind, uh, and the idea that you can send, for example, a high res image to a desktop and a low res image to a mobile is really key. There's a lot of JavaScript libraries and CSS uh, conventions that can help with that, um, but that's handled kind of at the Drupal level. So, um, you know, your uh, information architecture might say, give me a low res image and a high res image, and you'll be doing that at a Drupal level, but Content Hub will then push that image around the hub um, as required. Sure. So uh, <coughs> right now, Content Hub is pretty flexible in terms of giving you uh, the kind of content, the structure of content that you want to have in your content uh, from one tool to another, site to another. What's and so for the most part, you can do it by a, a you can move most kinds of content that you need, including structured content, to a different way. Paragraph. We do have people who are bringing content into other CMS and converting those into CMS. And right now, it's uh, it can be done by a, a, a sort of a configuration process. And it makes the schema mapping a little bit easier to sort of to map different kinds of content together to create more of a universal kind of underlying architecture for schema. So it can be done now. No, so Content Hub's just a, an API-driven service with no interface of its own. Um, well, I think every single implementation we've done, Drupal becomes the editing interface and the management interface, so that's not strictly necessary. Um, but yeah, we, we don't see co Content Hub becoming kind of a web app where you log in and edit content. It's, that's not what it does. It's kind of plumbing to, to join sites together. Right. You know, at Octo, we're focused on, you know, we, we have a, want to make sure we have So it will be imported as completely structured content. So you'll just have like that interface I showed before, you'll be able to say import this. Um, and typically I think if you're doing Drupal to Drupal communication, it will be the same content type. So a news article is another news article. 
But again, that's not strictly necessary. You could create some rules on your side that says if I get a news article from site X, Y, and Z, convert it in this way. So, um, you know, the, the kind of the ideal is that a lot of that stuff just happens automatically, so there's no human intervention. So as soon as the site's published out, um, or as soon as content site published on a given site, it's pushed across other sites. In practice, I think most people want to make sure it's right before it goes out, but... It stores references to images, right? Not, yeah, so, so it'll store, store a URL to an image. Uh, and then on the client site, we'll ingest the image. Is that right? Uh, yeah, well, yeah. Uh, yeah, it stores in references and then the image is linked to the image. Yeah, so the short answer is yes. Yeah. Cool, so the last kind of product, I guess, I'll talk about is Lyft. And this kind of sits right at the top. So if you think of... Um, you think of uh, Drupal, uh, sorry, BLT and Lightning and Cloud as kind of representing the code, uh, and Site Factory is representing the site. This kind of represents the visitor, the person. Um, and so the idea is, you know, broadly it fits into the personalization category. Uh, and the idea is that we can know about every single visitor that comes to the site uh, and deliver them a, a, a customized, personalized experience depending on their device or their channel or the context in, in which they're visiting. And you know, Drupal's actually been quite good at what we call explicit personalization for years and years, which is when I've got a user account on a site and I say I like this and that and this other thing, Drupal's really good at, at editing a page or adaptively changing a page to suit those preferences. What it's maybe not quite as good at uh, is doing that for anonymous users that it knows nothing about. Um, there's some challenges there because clearly we don't know anything about them when they turn up. That's the biggest challenge, but there's also some performance issues, some management issues. How do we handle that? Um, so we have created this, this idea of Lyft, which is a client that runs uh, on top of your Drupal site. It allows you to track uh, a range of behavior about the user. So broadly that's situational behavior. So when I turn up, I, I can tell that I'm on my iPhone. I can tell by my IP that I live in London because I know the time in that I'm in London. I know the time of day in London. I know what the weather is. As I begin to browse through the site, we start looking at behavioral data. So I start clicking on certain things. I can say, oh, it looks like this guy's interested in mountain bikes and headphones. Uh, I'm gonna show him content about that. Or well, it looks like this guy or people on iPhones tend to click on that banner and not that banner. Maybe the next person who's on an iPhone, I'll, I'll show the, the banner that they click on. Uh, and yeah, all of that we can all report on. It all sits in the cloud. It runs as a service integrated with Drupal. So, a workflow might be, I turn up, um, we can tell that click, this woman's come in, she's clicked some pages, she's searched for some stuff, she might have downloaded some documents, so we know a behavior. We know a situation, she's on a mobile device, she's in New York. She fills in a form which uh, gives us an email address, so now we can, if she comes back, and we can link her against that email address. But also we can start to look into other databases, so if I've got a CRM, uh, if I've uh, got some other place where I'm storing data about that user because we can now link her against her email, we can see all of her history. So, you know, she, we can figure out whether she's someone who's bought from us before or not. If she is, we'll show something different. That's the idea. So we want to try and capture uh, as much data as we can about the user's journey on every touch point, um, every data source. And once we have that, we can start doing stuff with it. So from analytics, kind of at the, at the simplest level, starting to do types of testing, types of targeting. Uh, we can also use the data in the database in other systems. So it doesn't necessarily need to be Drupal that's displaying the results of that personalization. It could be like an email campaign or anything else. You can just pull into the data via API and do things with it. So, you know, you might have probably been victim of, uh, you've visited a site and you've clicked on a whole bunch of stuff and you get an email the next day saying, oh, I hear you want to buy a new computer. That's the kind of thing that Lyft can enable in a much better way, of course. Uh, there's also that unified visit, visitor profile is reportable. Uh, it sits in a schemaless database. You can look at people visiting. You can figure out um, you know, what sort of people do what. Uh, you can create dynamic segments uh, so that uh, after a user does define things, uh, they can fit into a segment uh, which you can then use for further reporting or personalization. Uh, and like everything we try to do, you can do that via the web, or you can do it via an API. And, and so the idea is that you can do behavioral targeting um, or you can do A, B, and N testing. And it can get really big and complex. Personalization is not a 
simple thing. Um, but the, we, the idea is basically if we can keep really good data, eventually we can come up with some really good insights. And the longer we do it, the better we get at it. Um, and I think Lyft's really good at that. Uh, the architecture is set up in such a way that uh, you can really get uh, a lot of information about who your visitors are. And a CMS aware way as well. So it knows about the metadata in your site and knows about your information architecture. So it can use a lot of that stuff that maybe a, a standard analytics package might not do. So if we go back to this, uh, hopefully that diagram with all those buzzwords on it makes a little bit more sense. Um, we can see, you know, this is where the things fit in. So over here, it's like BLT pipelines, um, cloud, cloud site factory, uh, Drupal and Lightning, Content Hub, and then pushing it out across all of those devices. And hopefully that all makes sense against the cycle. Um, it's always a challenge, but we feel like we're getting there. Oh. I won't go into partners just on the basis of time, but basically we can help you uh, with this. So we have, we want to be a subscriptions company. We don't want to uh, sell services necessarily, but what we want, do want to do is make sure that if you're using Drupal and you're using Aqua, you're using it in the best way. So if you need some help, we can provide that uh, in lots of ways, whether that's someone coming in and sitting beside you or whether it's someone on the end of the phone or whether it's training, we can do all that kind of stuff. Um, in fact, I think there's some, if you're interested, the certification going on during DrupalCon for free. So if you feel like trying one of the certification uh, classes, uh, would be worth checking. That's it. So it's about time. Does anyone have any further questions? <laughs> you go. Yeah, thank you. How does someone that would like to infiltrate you get their own self for example? Do I need a developer? Do I need your support? Is there a GP connector? Someone from Adjetti to the Salesforce database? Do I have a UI where I can pick up the, the fields I'm, I need? Can I also enrich the Salesforce database with the GP connections I have from the, I would say, global ecosystem? Do you want to cover that one? Sure. So uh, there's a couple different ways that you can get information and permission for Salesforce to use their customer information. One thing you can do is in Drupal itself, any information that Drupal has access to can be sent to Lyft via an identifier actually in the Lyft module. So basically when you, you know, just the same way if someone registers for an email, you say, hey, this user's got this email some other information you might know about them. Hey, this person worked at this or this person comes from this company. That's one way to get the information that Drupal might know and then put it in your site and get it across to your end users. Uh, the other thing you can do is enrich your own list via Lyft API. We'll call it Lyft. You can enrich it with a Lyft API and get information directly via the Lyft API. Uh, whether you would have to do that programmatically, I wouldn't say that. I know that there's a lot of work that's going on where you can uh, connect it and send it. I think right now you probably have to write some programming on Lyft in order to get that to work. So the API is open, like you can go on our site docs.aqua.com slash API and read the API, like it's, there's no secret source there. Uh, we will, as time goes on, have connectors in kind of the same way we do for Content Hub. Um, as they come up, we'll develop them and put them out there. I don't think we've got kind of a mature one for Salesforce yet. We probably have customers somewhere doing some kind of Salesforce integration, but not in a way that we can kind of put out there as a product that's been tested in all use cases kind of thing. There's no firewall bound up there. Okay, cool. Pete, you have a? Yeah, so um, you have a you have large enterprise customers that you can use to do any UI management platform. Um, how much more does it cost them to start adding on these other services? And, you know, how would they work incrementally Yeah, so uh, the answer, as I'm sure you can predict, is it depends. Yeah, um, a lot of this stuff, um, so like a lot of the stuff I started with is totally free. Some of the other stuff, like um, pipelines, for example, we're still knocking out the details. Some of it will be just available for all customers immediately. There'll be some other features that may not be, but we're not quite sure exactly what they are. Um, Lyft is just about to launch a new version very soon, uh, Lyft 3. Uh, I'm not privy to the pricing about that, but you might be. It's, uh, uh, it's structured so that it starts low, then you have low amount of users, and then you can adjust it by the number of add points and the number of uh, points in the direction that you're adapting. It's the number of unique visitors and number of decisions, is it? 
think the model. Yeah. So, so we, if we have a client that's you know, low there big, mm -hmm. they they kind of their their marketing team you know, like to spend money on HTML5 embeds, but they don't understand optimization and their metrics very well. Is you know, is there a way to get them on to something? You know, and it's ramp them up. Yeah, that's a question. I mean, what's the setup? I think it w it's not a freemium model. You can't you can't just turn it on. There is a, an entry price, um, but yeah, I mean, with the new launch, we will be uh, tearing it in such a way that you should be able to start something that you can demonstrate will add value immediately and ramp it up as it adds more and more. Um, con similarly, the Content Hub is based on the number of sites. Um, that's not there's no doesn't matter how much content, right? It's just sites, I think. Yeah. So again, it's a tiered uh, model where you. I've got five sites, I've got 50 sites, I've got 500 sites, and it's a different tier. Yeah. But yeah, swing by the booth and find a sales guy, I'm sure he'll start telling you things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? One thing we do at Aquila is we support the full stack of Rust libraries, but the infrastructure is just code. Uh, but we can't support any Travis CI because those outside of the scope of things that Aquila is allowed to do. But the pipeline we can support you in creating your CI. Another example of this partner, the LP Builds from Aquila, you know, while they were in a situation where they were doing build that involved Travis CI, it's great, like I said, Travis CI is great. They just hand off the build to, to uh, the customer. Customer doesn't know how to use Travis CI. The customer uh, starts calling up the partner and saying, "Hey, I'm having a problem a month or two later," and uh, the partner does not like this, right? They don't want to get calls two months later about uh, the details of the integration of builds. So uh, the pipeline that that scenario doesn't have to happen, right? Once it's handed off to the full pipeline, the customer can just create it off the full support um, And it, it just so basically, there's a, there's other things that we can do. That Special command in the YAML file for doing things like uh, deploying to a, a, an Aquila stage or something like that, which, which would require custom code. So for people who, if you're on Travis and you like Travis, you know, you can set up Aquila on Travis. A lot of the people who are uh, adopting pipelines are people who are more of the camp of, uh, they, they were not that happy with their current CI solution, so they didn't want to use the new solution. So pipelines are great for them. Good. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, so, everybody, stop by the booth. Just yeah. Punch out. <laughs> you probably need it today, huh? <laughs> <laughs>